it, it took a long time to kind of get here and figure a lot of the stuff out. People want the solution and they, you yeah. guys have it. Welcome back to Team O'Neill. I'm Chris. Uh, we're still here in Atlanta, Georgia with SimCraft. And guys, I really want to learn more about your actual units. So you're going to take me through a little bit of what these sim units are and how sure. you've built these and what is the difference between this thing and that thing. The flagship unit behind you here is what we call the Apex 6 GT Pro. Apex 6 um, GT so Pro. So Apex is the product line, the model you know, number okay. or model name, I should say. Uh, the 6 represents the degrees of freedom on the unit. Okay. Um, there are six ways to move in 3D space, and an Apex 6 represents all six ways implemented in, into a system. So, so maybe take me through what, what is happening. What is the, what, how is this unit move? So this unit moves uh, three rotations and three translations. So the rotations are roll, pitch, and yaw, and the translations are surge, sway, and heave. Um, so this unit moves in all possible directions. Um, all the degrees of freedom are independent from each other. And uh, to nerd out on you a little bit, um, our, our philosophy is actually based in physics. Uh, there's a discipline of study in physics called rigid body dynamics. And this is centuries old information and it talks about how a rigid body, like a car, moves through 3D space. Uh, the center of gravity or the center of mass is actually the origin of all the rotations of a car or an aircraft. Uh, there are other factors involved uh, such as aerodynamics, uh, your setup and your chassis, your suspension for instance is, is, is kind of making some you know adjustments to where the motion occurs but yeah. the center of mass is essentially the governing philosophy or the governing point of where rotations occur in a car. Okay. So. Um, if you think about like a formula style car, generally speaking, the driver's gonna be as close to the center of mass of the car as possible, right? right? Comes right down the middle of the car. Right. Of course, the distribution of mass of the car um, in terms of front engine, mid engine, um, is gonna dictate how far back in the car the, the um, lateral axis is. And uh, of course, yaw coming down vertically, but they all intersect. It's right. called a mutually perpendicular axis when you have X, Y, and Z intersecting at one spot. Okay. That one spot is the center of mass. Got it. Okay. So the philosophy that we take with our simulation equipment for motion is to recreate those same uh, relationships and the same principles, hmm. except the cockpit is the rigid body. Right. So the cockpit in its visuals and the seat and the human being, the driver, the center of mass of the cockpit is the governing location for where the motion occurs in a SimCraft application, which is one of the reasons we believe that our acclimation period for our equipment is near zero, right. and the, the adoption level for humans, lots of different humans, is very high because it moves the way rigid bodies move. Hmm. Um, degrees of freedom are independent from each other in this concept as well. Um, Closest and thing to reality. The closest thing to, it's, yeah, there's only one way things move in, in earth physics, right. and we try to follow that, that principle um, as close as possible. Okay. Um, so, so this is your, your peak This is product. the peak, yeah, there's no, there is no seventh degree of freedom, <laughs> okay. um, so this is, this is all. <laughs> not the, in the matrix yet, No, right? not okay. in the matrix, no. Nope. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but so essentially, um, the cockpit environment is now the thing that is sort of the variable, right? Okay. So the chassis itself to support the motion and create these independent degrees um, is the motion solution, but the cockpit is where your audio, your visual, all of your controls are, your seating and all your cockpit um, controls and all that kind of thing. So. So well, how did you do that? Like, what? How did you, you? You know, you wanted to keep the center of mass as the focus, right? Like, yes. how did you? What's the actual mechanics of how you made that happen with this unit? Well, so um, the center of mass is roughly in the location of this axis here, which is um, serves as both pitch for rotation and sway for um, lateral side to side translation. Um, it's roughly in this space, so you account for all the weight in the sim, and of course humans weigh different amounts, and we all have 
different distribution of mass on our own bodies, so it's an approximation. Um, but the, you know, one of the one of the key things here is if we were to take this actuator off right here, which controls the pitch motion. If you put a human being in that seat, you can move pitch with very little force, hmm. because equilibrium means um, being able to move things very easily, uh, ultimately. Okay. Right. So you got your 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 mass here. You've got a lever arm all the way back to this point, and um, it's very little force to actually move move the unit. And and every degree of freedom sort of follows a similar um, concept. Okay. So the weight supported. You got a bearing on this side. You have a bearing on the right side that supports the mass of the cockpit and the user inside of it. Okay. Um, so the bearings are doing the work. Of course, the framework around the cockpit is supporting the bearings. Um, of course, you need both in order to accomplish that. Okay. From there, you have a bearing underneath this frame here. Uh, we call uh, uh, the yaw bearing at the bottom there, in okay. the middle of the center of the cockpit, which establishes your vertical axis up through intersecting this other axis here that comes through the cockpit straight up to this bearing creating a vertical axis okay um, and so once again load is supported on these bearings right. um, that's a slewing table on the bottom there and it's capable of supporting 2,000 pounds roughly and can be oriented in different directions and still has the same uh, support um, um, that it would in, in a uh, horizontal fashion as it sits. Slewing table? Slewing table. Please yep. define. <laughs> I'm um, sure what that means. Well, it's a, uh, essentially a designed to have a distributed mass. Um, okay. It's a bearing that is, um, this one actually happens to be relatively small as slewing tables go, um, but at a um, you know, variable diameter, this one is roughly five and a half inches or so. Okay. And then um, the idea is you, the wider you get, the more mass you can support. Um, depending upon how much load is distributed off the sewing table would dictate sort of the size you would need. Hmm. Of course, the weight you're putting on it. Okay. Um, so it's meant to, you know, hold, hold weight, uh, hold a load, but also distribute it across a pretty wide area. Hmm. Um, and so last but not least uh, is uh, the roll frame that goes all the way up and around the unit here. Um, the top bearing and the bottom bearing for yaw and heave um, in the middle there essentially are then supported on this outer frame we call the roll frame. And the roll frame um, also has a bearing at the front and a, or excuse me, bearing at the back and a bearing at the front creating your lateral axis this way. Okay. And so if you imagine an axis here, an axis here, right. and an axis there, they all intersect right about in this location here. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, how rigid body moves, and okay. it's um, just one of the defining principles of of, um, of rigid bodies. Great. Um, so, so this is more of the actual engineering and mechanics of what's happening in a in a car. Yes. We have four wheels on the ground, right? But ultimately, where the weight of the car is being manipulated. That's correct. And you know, we talk about this in left foot braking and using race rally car training. We're not physically moving the weight of the car, but we're putting the weight on the, d the tires in different ways to make it do something. Sure. You've done this with a simulated unit, but that's a s the same concept. You, you actually just took what's happening in a real car and actually put it in a simulator. And Yeah, you know, so there's other, other ways that people achieve motion right. in a sim. Um, but this is really the only way cars move. This is the real simulation. So we feel like this is the highest fidelity that you can achieve because okay. we follow the various principles of moving in sort of a generic um, fashion or what the generic laws are of all rigid bodies. Right. Um, hmm. Independent degrees of freedom that rotate and translate at the center of mass. Right. This is ultimately the mouthful we try and <laughs> tell people. Put in a succinct and, you know, by the time we get halfway through it, most people are like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So. Um, you know, this is stuff that we've learned too. We didn't know this coming into it. It's taken us years to kind of figure out why our technology feels right and right. feels correct. Um, this is a bit of a sort of backwards learning. Right. Um, my father is the one who came up with the idea of using a three gimbaled approach because he wanted to build something low cost. Right. But it turns out he accidentally discovered that this is the way, this is the way you should actually build a motion sim. Right. Um, Similar to Tim O'Neill and the way Tim built our curriculum, he did it, he kept mis doing it by mistake, right? Yeah. Like trying to teach adults how to 
drive a rally car. Uh -huh. uh, they need less classroom. They need more classroom. They need you know all these little variables and differences, and that's how we came to our curriculum. And it's very funny how it's similar with what you've done here with this business and and your product. Um, so all these actuators are what are actually creating this sim, right? The, the motion, that, yes. The motion simulation. Yep, there's one actuator per degree of freedom, um, truly independent. So the mechanics are separated for an independent system here. And then you have an actuator per degree of freedom. Uh, they're electric actuators. Uh, most people don't believe me when I tell them this, but I'll go ahead and say it anyways. This motion technology runs off less power than your microwave at home. Assuming right. you have a thousand watt microwave, yeah. the peak peak consumption power for this sixed off motion system is 950 watts. Peak. Right. I was I was looking at this. I was thinking my electric bill is going to go nope. through the roof, but nope. you figured out. Well, the audio system. We we've got we've got a nice high end like home theater audio system that we put on this unit sure. um, for some of our clients that are a little bit more uh, particular for audio quality. Sure. And um, the power consumption of the audio system alone is greater than the motion system. Yep. Wow. So Matthew, you've used this a lot, and you've actually tried to, you've gone racing with this. So tell us, you know, from your side, the mechanics, you're now on the ownership side of SimCraft. Like, have you tweaked to this, or did, did you come here and did he figure it out? Or did he ever, what real world tweaks have you been able to add? Well, we've, as we've continued to the, evolve the technology. Um, when I came on board, we were just three degrees of freedom. Okay. So as we've continued to add the, the layers of the real world motion application, yep. one thing we've always tried to maintain is the aspect of the definition of simulation. Okay. The recreation of a system or process over time, which is why we've not swayed from the real world physics approach right. and parlayed that to this simulated environment, uh, environment approach. But putting damper technology on the equipment to make it respond a little bit more um, rigid like a real car does, uh, some of these enhancements have, have really changed the, the type of finesse that you can do within the motion profiling. Right. Um, and that's where the, the secret sauce really is, is being able to dial that in to almost um, undetectable fashion to the point where it doesn't feel fabricated. It doesn't feel like it's it's creating something that doesn't exist in the real world. Right. So as we continue to finesse the enhancements and delivering that, we've taken a lot of cueing from all of our professional drivers that work with us to help develop, but more importantly, validate the technology. Sure. Because if I can't get or we can't get buy-in from them, we're not going to get buy-in from an amateur driver that's going to want to do you know, take their racing ladder or take their racing development in house right. because then we're just like every other manufacturer out there trying to make things feel right. real without <laughs> them actually being real. Right. Convincing you through sales it's that garbage they're doing. In, garbage out. If that's you don't right. start with a philosophy, then right. you end up just kind of tweaking on something that's never going to, never going to get to this point. Right. We've um, had conversations with other manufacturers asking us why we did it this way. Sure. Well, Every, all vehicles move XYZ center of mass. So it, and also, he comes at it from a standpoint of he's much more consumer centric than I am. Right. I'm producer centric. Right. And so I think of problems and I solve problems and I develop product. But sometimes I don't see things that are basic user usability kind of things. So he's helped me learn a lot of that. Like how we have our dashboard even uh, integrated uh, was pushed. Uh, Matthew was, was really the the influence in our group to get us to do that. Um, you can get it in the cockpit, you can fire up all the power to the entire sim, you can boot the PC, it's all right there mm -hmm. uh, in the cockpit. And that was something that he and said, we need to have this. And I said, well, why the hell do we need that? You got a button up front, what do you, you know? And so ultimately, that's been a learning experience for me. Right. Um, getting to six degrees of freedom though, um, has been it's it was a long it was a long time I mean um, that was always your vision though with that um, I wouldn't say that's where it started no. um, okay. you know my vision was my, my dad did a three off we did a three off we okay. did roll pitch and yaw and um, back in 2011 we had a client who wanted um, additional degrees of freedom so we built them oh, it was okay. um, similar to the way we do surge now and we did fore and aft surge motion and side to side sway motion on essentially uh, a two linear bearing uh, table underneath, underneath the, uh, the three off. 
but it wasn't relative. So what I mean by that is sway is now integrated here, okay. right? So if you're yawed and then you sway, you sway relative to your yaw angle. Okay. And the same is true of roll. If, you're, if the sim is rolled over and you're on the banking of Daytona and the car sways, it's relative to the roll angle. When it's underneath, hmm. it was not relative. So this was, this was just an idea like, you know, just kind of came and it was like, okay, well, we should probably do it this way. So we did it and it worked great. And then Heave was the final one, and we both knew we needed it. These development cycles have been long and extensive with research and development. Sure. One of the big things about our approach to Heave specifically, yeah. it's all about lifting mass. Yep. And in the other applications, you'll see very robust and beefy actuators that are lifting the entire mass specifically in the Stewart platform. Yeah. So some of those equipment will you need three phase power. They'll need a monstrosity of a, a room to be able to facilitate all of these items. Hmm. One of the things that we wanted to maintain was our power efficiency. Right. Because we didn't want to spend 30 grand a month in power, nor, nor do any one of our clients want to do that. Right. So to be able to lift close to a thousand pounds or so without lifting any weight was critical to maintain that power efficiency. Amazing. So the so the lever is actually a, is a um, truly a lever. It's a two to one reduction. Um, so with half the force, we can lift double the weight. Um, so Matthew is about a thousand pounds. is pretty close. It's a little over, but it's pretty close. Um, and that actuator is is able to lift a thousand pounds with only half the actual force because of the lever mechanism. So simple machines are throughout this entire mm -hmm. machine. So hard Screws, to get there, right? Screws, gimbals, because levers. <laughs> yes. Yep. The, the solution is simple in theory, but it it's takes all that R&D. Well, it, it yeah. does, but that's also why mechanical engineers look at our product and they're like, this is freaking awesome. Like, yeah. they're well, seeing your dad figured it out, like yeah. he said. Right? Yeah. He yep. Budget being the primary factor, it's yeah. like, what's the cheapest, most efficient way? Yeah. Yep. Follow the science and, you know, the actual engineering of just what, what what this world is and try to replicate the world yeah and that's yep. the, the simplest way to make it happen yeah and you guys just did it in the most complete beautiful form Thank that you. that Thank i you. could imagine wanting to see something like this and this this technology i mean first as a customer i fell in love with it immediately yeah just because i saw the real world application i saw it in actual you know practicality right, right. seeing my sim training translate directly to the track um, that was that was critical for you know flipping your mindset like oh there's there's something pretty valuable here, um, but the big thing you know by by the definitions and by the reality of the real world, you know if it if simulation truly is the recreation of a system or process, then with independent degrees of freedom like the real world application, right. in full motion meaning six degrees of freedom operating in that fashion, then this approach is really the only true simulation technology out there. Right. By definition. By definition. Yeah, so all of the other six degrees of freedom units in the market have dependent degrees of freedom. Right. They're they, linked. They're, they're, linked they're all linked. The tire model, right? Like to me, if I was thinking of it, I would think four points on the ground like a tire, right? And then you're, you're not being true to the center mass problem, right? And so like... Yeah, and there's some, co some co competitors of ours that have tried that. And if you go drive them after driving this, yeah. you come back and tell me which one's oh, correct. Right. Yeah, and you I, know, I it's, want it's, to it's, just from a it, like, so, so in other words, it's, it, is, it is about like, you know, we can talk all day long about science and physics, right. but what really matters is the person in that seat. Feeling. Feeling like that connection. Right. I think when you were in the seat earlier, I believe I heard laughter. Yes. <laughs> and laughter to me is a sign of acceptance. No, I, I and and agree. and so one of the things that we get to do um, with this equipment is we get to witness that all the time. Right. I, and I said to, to Sarah earlier, we're going to see a grown man turn into a little boy here <laughs> because it's like it's that kind of emotional experience, I, which is why it exists. I can validate that. For sure. I got a chance to drive this unit and it's something that for me, it took about three or four laps and we took some more tweaks yep. as you guys done an amazing job mm -hmm. creating the user because of the, what you guys said to it, which I didn't even realize was you're not recreating all the G-force nope. because we can't do that. Nope. 
So you have to mimic that GeForce yep. initiation. Initial GQ, yeah, right. G load, yeah. Okay, initial G load. So yep. that allow your system allows us to tweak that for my feeling. Yep. And once we tweaked it by that first lap of that second tweak, it was um, I felt like I was in the real car. When we were talking about motion tuning yes. and perception right. and removing the, the actual sustain G right. on your body, the gravity on your body over or around a full corner, you remove that from the equation and then your perception is different than Matthew's perception. So Matthew drove the unit before you did and he's right. like, this feels good. Right. And you got in, you're like, it feels pretty good, but, but I need a little more of this. Right. That's what we're talking about. And that's and you gave your customers the option to have that with this tool. And you know, the next video we're going to do is we're going to talk about what you need to do, uh, what you need to think about when you're buying a unit. But you know, we're going to keep looking at these units with you. I want to understand. So this is your flagship, highest dollar, highest investment, but full solution, yes. right? We have this yeah, let's that'll talk about kind the of. CT take us down yeah. a little a few steps it's a little smaller footprint yeah well that's so why it exists we took the same exact cockpit out of our flagship this okay. is the same frame here the black piece the black okay. chassis component here same exact cockpit okay. um and we basically built what you see in red um a pitch up or pitch uprights here create uh pitch and sway same just like it does over here right yep. just uh, only halfway up and then the yaw halo, the red piece all the way around. Um, yaw is uh, a little different on this unit. We balance that yaw halo across a distributed uh, load. We actually use ball transfers, which work quite well. Hmm. And the weight's distributed on ball transfers and it sway, or excuse me, it yaws uh, very smoothly. And then all the way in the bottom, we have surge. Um, so it's the same components we use on the flagship Okay. just in a smaller footprint. Um, so this is what we believe the maximum we can take the small footprint or C we like yeah. to call the CT or compact trainer okay. is what CT stands for. And um, four degrees of freedom in a small footprint like this really allows for, you know, and, and then we say in the field, two thirds the physics for half the price is ultimately how it works out. Right. Um, you're never going to be able to get roll without a large chassis like this, because right. the way that we do it is we support the load, we have the bearings. You can't do that on this here. Um, sure. So uh, roll and heave for the two degrees missing from here. But right. you drove this unit. I did. And, and it was shockingly close yeah. to the point, it, w it would be hard, I'm not a good enough driver that I could justify the investment, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think my nuance, uh, my difference of my own ignorance in driving this would be such a close enough solution. And then it's like, you know, in two or three years, I would probably regret it, right? Because then I'd be a good enough driver. Well, the good news is it's upgradable. Oh, really? Absolutely. Okay, we we can take that, that <laughs> cockpit out of there and literally put it into that chassis in two hours. Right. Right? So we- That's kind of why we say the Ford Fiesta is an amazing rally car. You could start at a two wheel drive, and, just set up and- yeah. Eventually, add components and get up to a more more advanced Same rally car. Here. Same philosophy. Wow. So, this unit starts with two degrees of freedom, okay. and then you can add two additional degrees of freedom separately if you want. Awesome. Um, the large footprint unit over here, the GT, mm -hmm. starts in three degrees. Roll pitch yaw. Our beginnings, yeah. and you can add sway, you can add surge, and you can add heave, wow. all modularly. That's amazing. So we, we we say our clients, we you know you start where you're comfortable. Yeah. And when you justify your investment and it justifies itself to you for yeah. wins and championships yeah. uh, or sheer exhilaration, <laughs> then you can, you can you know, justify spending more money and investing more money into That's your amazing. sim. Wow. Another big benefit of the independent degrees of freedom. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Just bolt on mechanical assemblies. You guys really did think about this. <laughs> That's amazing. It all didn't happen in one year. Right. It, it took a long time to kind of get here and figure a lot of this stuff out. We did make some good decisions along the way, thankfully, but um, yeah, our clients are sort of up and down the entire product line. Uh, we've actually sold more of the six than we have of our two, our entry level, uh, historically over the last three years.